good. Well, thank you, worship team. Why don't you stay standing just for a moment? Today's Pentecost Sunday, and I think it's appropriate that, um, that we pray together. Come on, why don't we lift our hands? Holy Spirit, come. Breathe on us. Let your fire fall. Fill us to overflowing, Lord. We humble ourselves before you and say we need you in our lives. Father, we pray that you would use these words that you've given me, that you would speak to your people. Lord, that your anointing would fall in this place. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. 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 Touch three people and tell them registrations close on Wednesday. Wednesday. Holy fire fall, come and fill this place with your presence. Like a rushing wind, spirit breathe on us, wind of heaven breathe. I love that song, Lisa. That's awesome. So catchy. I think that's why sometimes we actually put scripture into catchy tunes and it helps us to actually learn really good, deep truths about the word of God and about who God is and about how he works. We sing these things and it catches. I love it when there's a good tune applied to it so it actually makes it easy to remember. <sighs> you good? Yes. I'm excited because it's Pentecost Sunday. And this is, well, it's kind of like the day where we talk about all things Pentecost. Um, our church is a Pentecostal church. And I want to explain a little bit for those who don't really understand what it's all about and why is, what's this word Pentecost how much does a penny cost? I don't know. You have to go and find out. Uh, maybe Google it. Um, but it's not the, the word's actually different, and I want to explain a little bit about what it means. And the word Pentecost actually literally means fifty. All right, so it means fifty, and it was fifty days after the Passover, and this was a a um, a festival that was held every year. Um, to, to bring people in called the Festival of Weeks or Shavuot. And that's when people would come in from all over. They would come into Jerusalem. They would come for all Jews from, from every single nation on earth that was known at that time, maybe not Jews from Australia, um, because they would have had trouble getting there in time. They probably would have had to leave at the Shavuot before to get to that one. Um, so everyone gathered together. And they were there in the one place in every nation that was known. And it was, they had this celebration. So everybody's all together. And it's exactly, it's, it's, it's 50 days after the Passover. Now, what happened at Passover in the year 33 AD? Jesus died at Passover. And then he rose again. And it was 40 days, 40 days that he was with and he was ministering to the people, and then 10 days after that, after Jesus ascended into heaven, we have this festival of Pentecost. So there's this, this gaps in these times, and every nation that was under earth was gathered there. They were all in this one place. It was kind of interesting because, as Lisa talked about and Rachel talked about, they were gathered together in the, um, the, the Jews that were there who had been with Jesus and been around him and followed his teaching. They were, with, they were together in one place, but it was more than that. There was people from all over the world who were together in one place. And, you know, and Jesus had left them and he said to them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he said, you, know, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. And then he ascends into heaven. And they're like... What do we do now? They've got 10 days. 10 days between when Jesus left and when the Holy Spirit was poured out. So what did they get up to? What were the disciples doing? And Acts teaches us um, and, and it opens up this, this thing that there was two things that they did during the day that were recorded. Number one, they voted a replacement for Judas. All right? And they did that by gambling. Right? They said the Bible says they cast lots. They go, okay, well, we've got two people here. They're going to be good. We're going to pick the short straw. Who's going to get the job? And they did that. And then the other thing that they did is that they actually dedicated and committed themselves to prayer. They had a 10-day prayer meeting in the lead-up to the Holy Spirit being poured out. And this is one of the things that's, that's relevant in the church. Who's ever been to a 10-day long prayer meeting? No one? Judy Hutch has been to a 10-day long prayer meeting. 
All right. Oh, no, you're putting your hand up to run a 10-day-long prayer meeting. I think that's a great idea. Let's get it. But they dedicated themselves to prayer, and the and Book of Acts teaches us that there was 120 people who were gathered there, and they were just passionately praying and waiting. Because Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples, but wait for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. Go, but wait. So they were waiting, and while they were waiting, they didn't waste time. They prayed and they dedicated themselves to prayer. And hey, maybe that's what we need to do in the future. Maybe we need to do a 10 days of prayer in the lead up to Pentecost to see God really move and shift and change in our lives. We're a Pentecostal church and we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to not only transform lives, but to help us with the gifts of the Spirit to move amongst us, to see signs and wonders and miracles. We believe in that. But maybe we uh, sometimes have a little bit of a lack of understanding about what is this Holy Spirit all about? Who is he? What does this do? How does it work? What does it mean for me? And I think sometimes we could probably label ourselves less Pentecostal and more Pentecurious. We want to know, but maybe we're a little bit unsure. Is it that it makes sense to people? We really want the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, pour your spirit out. Yes, we were, but... What does that actually mean for me? What's it going to do? I'm on the fence on this. And we sit back and we wait for somebody else to dip their toe in the water before we actually step in ourselves. And we would go, I'm curious, but I don't know enough about it. So we're going to dive in a little bit this morning. And what we see is from people today is a bit of an agnosticism about the Holy Spirit. Not disbelief, but an I don't know. I just don't know. And therefore, we put the Holy Spirit into the too hard basket. You know? And we need to have a longing to understand who he is and how to live in the flow of his power. If you're wondering why I'm sitting on a stool, this is for your benefit. It is to keep me on track. Because the last time I was this geared up to preach, I got a bit distracted. So taking wisdom on board from wonderful, wise people who speak into our lives. I'm sitting today because I am, seriously, I could, I'm ready to go. Let's have a look at a couple of things. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God. We believe in the triune God, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are three in one. Not split personalities, but separate function. They do um, different things, but they are the same. They are one. God the Father oversees creation, providence. Jesus brings redemption and kingship. And the Holy Spirit works in us to convict of sin and regenerate us. He lives within us and he empowers us to live for him. We can't live a holy life without the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible is constantly calling us into holiness. You can't read a scripture and uh, about our lives and go, it's okay to live however you want and then come to church on Sunday and we'll just wash it all away. No, he calls us into a holy life. He calls us to live separate. He calls us not to live like the world lives, but to live as though he's described in his word. And we can't do that without the power of the Holy Spirit. It's why we need him. And the, you, you can't see, this is, this is like one of the descriptors of it, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, is that um, one of the descriptors of the Holy Spirit is the wind. We see that in Acts 2, 4, like the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Um, you see, you can't see the wind, you can't see the Holy Spirit. You can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. You can look outside at a tree that is blowing in the gale and go, I can see the wind. No, you can't. You can see the effects of the wind. You might even see like all this dust that's being blown across a field. Maybe it's um, harvest time or cropping time and there's a wind up and everything's being stirred up. There's all this dust and you see this wind blowing across and you see all this haze and things. You go, I can see the wind. No, you can't. You can see what's in the wind and what's stuck in the wind. And it's the same with the Holy Spirit. You can't see the Holy Spirit, but you can see the transformative work in people through his power. What do we mean by that? If the Holy Spirit is living and active inside of someone, there's evidence. 
There's evidence. And there's four key evidences that we talk about in Scripture that point to somebody being filled with the Holy Spirit. The first one, and this is the, what we call the initial evidence and it's the, of being filled with the Spirit, and that is speaking in tongues. And it's a prayer language, and that happened at the day of Pentecost. Now, there's all sorts of different scholars who will argue what that was, right? Oh, was it actually speaking in tongues like a heavenly language, or was it speaking in a language that wasn't their own? Both. Pekenolostos. It was both things. And in different parts of the book of Acts, it actually points to both examples of people speaking in somebody else's language, an earthly language that they didn't learn, and also a heavenly language that they didn't learn that was given to them and that is what entunes us with the holy spirit we speak in tongues it connects our spirit with the spirit of god it helps us to pray it helps us to um to to when sometimes we just don't even know what to pray speak in tongues and that's one of those those things so that's the first evidence is um the initial evidence of speaking in tongues the second evidence and these are the other three We focus on, and we talk about in the Pentecostal church, we only focus on the first one. We focus on the gift of the Holy Spirit means that you speak in tongues. Right? We talk about that a lot. But there's three more. And we don't talk about them really at all. And I think we need to change that. So I'm changing it now. The second one is transformed character. If you've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you, people should be able to see that you are changing not completely changed but you are changing becoming more like Christ you know this is a witness to the profound change in a way an individual interacts with others and handles life's challenges if you've got the Holy Spirit inside of you the way that you work the way that you play the way that you interact and you relate to other people is changed you are transformed and you are being transformed This is evidence of you being filled with the Spirit, of of His work inside of you. And sometimes we just go, well, I speak in tongues, but we want to go and live our own way. Well, hang on, let's get back to the core of this. There's four, three, four, three, four of these evidences. Here's the third one. And this one's kind of aligned with the second one. And that is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control these are other evidences if the holy spirit is living and working in your life then you will be replicating and producing the fruit of the world you'll be producing the fruit of coals no you produce the fruit of the spirit and if the thing is, once again, if, if these things are things that we're struggling with, they, these are the things that should be evident that they're starting to come out. Now, when you plant a tree, like the Holy Spirit is planted within us, the next day you don't automatically bear fruit. I mean, you plant a fruit tree, it could take years for it to actually produce a proper amount of fruit that it's, that it's supposed to. It takes a long time and this is a journey that we are on but we are starting to see the fruit form and maybe the first year of the fruit that you are producing, maybe the fruit's small or it's not very good. So we just got, we had a lemon tree that we planted a couple of years ago and last year I think the lemons weren't that great. We got one lemon last year. This year we've had an abundance of lemons and we are praying for you that you have an abundance of lemons Abundance of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And finally, number four, this is not finally, my message is not over, so don't get excited about that. So we have speaking in tongues. Tongues is a gift from the Spirit. We have the um, transformative character. We're not the same. Where we used to go and maybe steal or lie or cheat people, we don't do that anymore because we have been transformed. We have the fruit of the Spirit. And finally, the gifts of the Spirit will be evident in your life. Not everybody gets all of the different gifts, but we all have access to them. Not everybody is going to have the the gift of prophecy. 
the gift of healing, the gift of wisdom and discernment or words of knowledge. Not everybody has, and some people actually do have that specific gift that they operate in. But we all, as being people who have the Holy Spirit living within us, have access to these and at times will operate in that particular gift. I don't have the gift of healing. I don't. And I'm okay with that. But I still believe and will lay hands on people to be healed in Jesus' name. And we've seen it happen. That's not my gift. That's just something that, I, that sometimes will happen when I operate in it. So we, we see that there's these gifts. And I don't believe necessarily that I have, you know, I'm not a prophet in the sense that people go, oh, I want to go to this prophetic ministry and they're going to, they're going to give me, there's going to give out 20 or 30 prophetic words over people. I don't operate that. But does that mean that sometimes I don't prophesy? No, sometimes I do prophesy. And pretty much every week when I get up into the pulpit, I prophesy. It's, um, so I want you to understand the difference between somebody who always operates in that particular gift and somebody who has access to operate in those gifts. We all have access if we have the gift of the Spirit within us. All right. So we see that um, we're, we're moving on here. We've sort of talked a little bit about who the Holy Spirit is and what is the evidence of his being in your life. It says in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And in Acts 2.1-4, to this is where we're getting down to the rubber meeting the road. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place and suddenly... There came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues, I always thought that they were standing. I mean, for me, a Pentecostal prayer meeting, you stand up, right? I mean, you just stand up, you march around, you move up and down. I mean, they're having a a prayer meeting. But maybe they didn't have a Pentecostal prayer meeting because the day of Pentecost hadn't yet come. And then they weren't, as soon as they were filled, they all stood up and started to walk around and pray. Maybe, I don't know. We're speculating. It's fine. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And these are the, some of the key passages that we look at when we talk about Pentecost Sunday. This is what happened at this first initial. And then from this point onwards, we see the birth of of the church. This is the key catalyst that birthed what we have today, this gathering together of people to celebrate and to worship God in the format, the way that we have it, is because of this instance. We don't have it because of anything else. We have it because of this. That was timely. Was that Siri? Siri is listening. Siri, you need to listen harder. I tell you what, you might learn something. Oh, my Siri's playing up now. Oh, my goodness. Everybody turn Siri off. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's have a look at the, what the Old Testament says about the Holy Spirit and points to. We see these things called images of the Holy Spirit. And Pastor Rachel talked about one last week. We're going to dive into that a little bit more today. But it's this thing what we call typology, where the Holy Spirit or something else, there's so much typology in the Old Testament that points to Jesus. And you can't, in every single book in the Old Testament, there is something, an image that is painted for us that points us to Jesus Christ. And his work on the cross. But there's also images about the Holy Spirit and his work. And just for Tate's benefit, he was a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. This is what happened in Exodus. In the Oh, Tate, missed the cue. I gave, he asked for an opportunity and I gave him one. No, but it's, it's not going to happen in the name of Jesus. So we, Tate was going to fill the room with cloud. Oh, here we go. In the Jesus. <laughs> we just wanted to joke. That's fine. But he's represented in this guardian. He protected them and kept them safe and showed the way by praying this pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day to guide them to where they were supposed to go. But there's a whole bunch of different um, uh, typology in, in, the, in the Holy Spirit. And we see um, 
these images that highlight his role, his qualities, and his actions. And the first one, which Rachel talked about last week, was oil. Which she touched on the oil. And this is actually poured out and demonstrated in different passages of Scripture, in 1 Samuel, Isaiah, and also in Luke, we see this oil being used. And it, this act of anointing with oil in the Old Testament represents the Holy Spirit's power and presence being bestowed upon an individual for a specific purpose. There's, there's purpose in the power. And what's the purpose of power? Is people. This is why we get anointed to actually, we get anointed to do something. Not to get anointed so that we can look good. So Simon the sorcerer, it talks about him in the book of Acts. He saw the power that was on the apostles and he goes, I want that too. And he tried to pay them for it. And the thing is this, is that he actually got rebuked for desiring that gift But then it says later that when they prayed for them all, that even Simon the sorcerer got the power of the Holy Spirit. It was filled with the Spirit. So we can't, he wanted it for his own purposes. He wanted it because he saw that he could make money out of it. I could use this for magic. But the purpose is to actually use it to impact other people. Now we see this with David, the oil was poured, it was anointed. And it actually says that when he was anointed, that the Holy Spirit rushed upon him from that day forward. That he was given a special anointing, even though he was a young kid and he hadn't fully come into his kingship, that he was anointed as king and it took years, but he had power from the Holy Spirit from that point. And we see this with the, the widow in 2 Kings chapter 3, which Rachel was talking about, that pouring out of the oil into space, into, into jars, and the, the oil only stopped when there was no more room, when there was no more jars to fill. There was no more space to contain it and hold it. And the oil is um, indicative of the Holy Spirit's anointing on our lives, enabling. We also see the, the Holy Spirit represented as water. Um, and it symbolizes his ability to cleanse and refresh and give life to our souls. And it's in water that we see the concept of baptism. And it says in John 7, 37, it says that on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now he said this, about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And we see this picture of this pouring out of water, this river that is not supposed to run from Jesus, but it's supposed to run from us. And that's what it says. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Water, we have access to this water, and Jesus actually describes it as the Holy Spirit. And this this flow on, so this 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 um this picture of us being pouring out so that we can also receive more. Because the thing is, is that if we are always full, we've got no room to receive anything. And it's not for us. And we've got to always remember that the purpose of power is people, and we are supposed to be pouring out to others so that we can yet be filled again. We see another bird picture of this wind or this breath and we see this in the book of Genesis. So the Holy Spirit and the word that they use for the Holy Spirit in in Genesis where it talks about the Holy Spirit was brooding over the waters. That word is the Ruach and it means the wind, the breath of God. And then we see this represented all through Scripture. And I've got way too many notes to be able to finish this sermon today. But I want to just touch on a few things. But this word, ruah, and the Greek word pneuma, they both mean wind or breath. And they symbolize the Holy Spirit's invisible, we talked about that before, yet powerful presence. This wind is creative and it's transformative. Um, it says in John 3, 8, that the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. And so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. We need the wind of God in our lives. 
And the last one I have here is this picture of fire. And this is the one I really wanted to focus on for a little bit today. It says in Matthew 3, 11, it says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He will baptize you. This is, we get this picture back again of this symbolizing of water, which everyone was used to, this understanding of being baptized in water. And now John the Baptist is saying that there's one who's coming after me who's greater than I am, and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You know, we see this in, in the, the book of Acts in chapter 2 when, the, when the, the mighty rushing wind fills the room and then tongues of fire start to appear on their head. This shows the power and the transformative nature of the Holy Spirit. Our um, scripture for this year is from Isaiah chapter 6. And we've been talking about this a little bit. And while this passage of scripture from Isaiah 6, is not completely aligned with the Holy Spirit. We see that the same power and the same quality is in, in, in the coal as in the fire of the Holy Spirit. It says in Isaiah 6, verse 6, then one of the seraphim, this is Isaiah who has been given this vision, encounter with the Holy God, and he's like, I can't even stand in his presence. I can't even be, woe is me because I've seen the Holy One and lived. He feels not worthy, uncapable. He feels like he shouldn't be there. His life's a mess. He feels like I'm not qualified to do what I'm I'm about to be asked to do. There's no way that I can be doing this. And in one instance, everything changed. It says that one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has been taken away and your sin atoned for. See, this coal, it's a, it's a symbol of the purifying power of the Holy Spirit. The Isaiah's vision occurs in this context. It's a divine counter of the holiness of God. And we realize our own sinfulness through it and we receive through the fire of the Holy Spirit. When we come into God's holy presence, we are confronted with our own sin and we, we, um, we receive through his fire this cleansing and commissioning. This burning coal represents a few different layers of symbolism with the Holy Spirit. Purification and atonement, this first effect purifies Isaiah. His guilt is taken away. As the Holy Spirit does is that he convicts us of sin in our lives. And this is indicative of the the fire of the Holy Spirit. And this act of cleansing is so crucial for Isaiah to understand and, and for us to understand that to be able to stand in the presence of a holy God, we need to be purified. We need to be holy. The second thing is this, this symbol of altar and sacrifice. The coal comes from the altar, this place of sacrifice and atonement in the temple. And this connection signifies this purification comes through a divinely appointed means. Um, so we, we can't just go, well, we just want to get our purification from any old place, any old time. No, you come to the altar to be purified. We have this connection with the Holy Spirit that through this, we can see that his sanctification is working within us. This Holy Spirit fire is present in this verse and this coal is representative of that. We need his purification. But the third, the thing that really stands out for this is that through the fire of the Holy Spirit, Isaiah is not only cleansed, but he's commissioned and he is sent forward. We can't just stay in the same place. We can't just stay doing the same things that we've always been doing. When we're touched by fire, we are called out of obscurity and into his presence. We are empowered for ministry. I've got a a smoker at home, uh, and I love to cook smoked meats. Um, You put the coals in there. It's it's made of ceramic. It's this kind of egg-shaped thing. And and you put the coals in there, and um, and you, you might heat it up. Uh, and then you, you can cool it down and you can close all the vents on it to actually turn it off. And it might take 
you know, a good three or four, maybe five hours to completely like die out, the, the coals die out. But at any stage during that process, when, when you're tr- if you wanted to reheat and restoke the fire in that, all you'd have to do is just open the vents, right? So you'd open the bottom vent and the top vent to allow air to flow through. And, and the air flows through the coals and up out through the top vent therefore reigniting them and what you see happen is you see the temperature that's gone down to maybe 50 degrees start to climb it starts to to grow and 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 I think this is indicative of us a little bit we often will let the coal die down we will let the fire of the Holy Spirit that is burning within our hearts die down because we get we get distracted because we get disheartened, because we let the things of the world come into focus more than the things of God come into focus and we let this coal die down to... Where, I mean, you can look inside this, this, this smoker and you can see that there's, not, there's no redness. It's, it's, it's black. You, we can see that... The, but if you open up the vents and you let the air flow through these coals, they will reignite and they will start to heat up again. But we let our coals die down to the point where they're black. But I'm telling you this is that the Holy Spirit is still alive within us. But we need to ask him to breathe again and get a fresh wind from heaven to blow on those coals to reignite the fan. The Bible teaches us the fan into flame, the gift that is given us. That means that we need to be present and active and working in it. To fan means to actually we've got to do something about it. See, I told you I needed to sit down today. I'm getting excited. All right, we've got to to finish. So we've got these four key images and used in Scripture to depict the Holy Spirit, oil, water, wind, and fire. So why do we need the Holy Spirit? We need the Holy Spirit because we have a mission. Luke 4, 18 says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And if we could have the worship team come. We have a mission and we can't do it alone. John 14, 16 says, And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. We need the Holy Spirit to work within us. We need the Holy Spirit to work within us. We can't do this by ourselves. We can't do this alone. We've got to get desperate for this. Now, how do we receive the Holy Spirit? How do we actually get the Holy Spirit within us? And I've got a really couple of really quick points. And then we're going to pray. We're going to lay hands on people. And we're going to believe for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. You might say, Pastor Andrew, I've had that before. No, the Bible teaches us that we need to be continually being filled. The Bible says it in such a way that uses the language, don't be filled once. It says, be being filled. We need it in our lives. And Acts contains a blueprint for us to actually receive the Holy Spirit. I want you to start to get anticipate what the Holy Spirit can possibly do in your life. Acts chapter 8, verse 14, it says, Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria, hang on, this is not normal. This is Samaria. And we heard from John before about the woman who was at the well. She was a Samaritan. I mean, these guys don't interact. But when the people at Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John. And he went down and prayed for them and that they might receive the Holy Spirit for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And we see in Acts 10, Acts 19, Acts 2, all of these instances of the Holy Spirit being poured out It was due to the people's proximity to the Word of God. They were in proximity. They needed to position themselves near to where the altar was, near to where the Word of God was being spoken, near so they could actually receive Jesus. They had to come near. If you want the Holy Spirit, you need to position yourself. The Bible teaches us that to receive the Holy Spirit, we need to repent. 
Peter says this in Acts 2, Repent and be baptized and you will be filled with the Spirit. Joel 2, 28, we love this verse. We love it. It's a Pentecostal's go-to verse. But in the, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. And sons and daughters will prophesy and old men will dream dreams and all of that. We love that. But before that promise of the Holy Spirit being poured out, the rest of the passage of Scripture is about repentance. Turn away from what you're doing. Repent of your sin. And then I'm going to pour out my Spirit. We've got to position ourselves. We've got to come with a heart of repentance. We need to ask for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. Act Matthew 7, 8, For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be open. And I said this before about be being filled. Ephesians 5, 18. Legalists love this one, but so do Pentecostals. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Pastor Andrew, that says be filled with the Spirit. If you go back and you dive into the Greek, it uses this terminology called the present imperative tense for be filled, indicating a continuous action. Don't be filled once. Some of us think we're in an asterisk comic. And we were like Oblix who um, fell into the vat and he never needs the extra power. No, we need to be continually going back to the source and being filled by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Uganda, we were driving along the roads and we kept seeing all of these kids with these giant jugs, these 20-gallon drug jugs of um, water, and they're lugging them back to their homes. And they had been walking miles to go and fill them up, Right? They had to do this every day because their house, by what they had by themselves, they didn't have the source. So they had to continually go to the source. We've got running water in our houses. We're a little bit spoiled. In that sense, we don't have to. (coughs) I'm getting too passionate. That's why I was sitting down. They couldn't get it where they were, so they had to go to the source. Why do we need to continually be being filled? We need to be filled so that we can pour out to others. And as we pour out, we go back and we get more. And as we pour out, we go back and we get more. And as we pour out, we can go back and get more. You might have said, Pastor Andrew, I've been baptised in the Holy Spirit. Good. Get baptised again. You're going to need it. You're going to need it because the things that you face and the challenges that come against you and the things of this world, you're going to need the wisdom, the power, the enablement of the Holy Spirit to be able to get through all of the challenges. And I started talking really fast. We need to pour out. So what we're going to do is we're going to stand to our feet. We're going to pray for you. We said that this is an anointing service. And no, this is not something that is specifically prescribed in Scripture, but we're going to come around. Actually, we're going to get you to come to us. And we've got our eldership. Um, Allison's here. One of our, our campus um, pastor from Neil is here. We're going to have these guys positioned down the front. So John and Cheryl, would you come? And Rachel, would you come? Spread yourselves right across the front. What these guys are going to do, we want you to come to the front. We want you to line up where they are. I'm going to be down here as well. And we are going to pray over you. And we're going to anoint you with oil. Now, this isn't particularly described in Scripture, but in church history, the anointing of oil often precedes the infilling and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we are going to anoint you with oil and we're going to pray over you that you are filled to overflowing and that God's Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit rests upon you, empowers you, enables you to be able to live the life that you were called to live. We don't want you to be shy in this. We don't want you to be standoffish and go, well, that's not for me. No, it is for everyone. We are desperate for the Holy Spirit. Why are we desperate for the Holy Spirit? We are desperate for Him because we want to see our city changed. We want to see our region changed. It's not for us. It's for everybody else. So we're desperate for Him. So what we're going to do right now is that I'm going to close the service. I'm going to pray the prayer of blessing. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get, I want all of our production team to come to the front first. And we're going to start to pray over them. And then I want you to come. And we're going to get some of our team, we're going to come up here. We're going to lay hands on all of these musicians and singers because they often get left to last. But we're going to get them first. So, But while they're getting prayed for, we want you to actually come to the front as well. Why don't you stretch forward your hands. Let me pray the blessing over you. And then we'll close the service.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace.